So, we're going to start way back about 2,500 years ago in ancient Greece. Now, at this point in time, science doesn't exist yet. Now, when I say science, I don't mean the laws of physics or how chemical reactions occur or you know, the existence of evolution and biology. Those things all exist, regardless of whether or not we understand them. When I say science, what I mean is a particular framework for how we understand the world. I mean the scientific method, this idea that you notice things about the world, you come up with questions about them, you have a hypothesis for what you think is going on, and then you design an experiment to test that hypothesis. You get a bunch of data, you analyze that data, you come to a conclusion, and that conclusion might lead you to whole new questions. That technique for understanding the world doesn't exist yet. It hasn't been invented. Do you want to see a question from Joaquin? Uh, what's the consensus? Oh, consensus is like uh, agreeing to things together. Like when we all come to an agreement is a, is a consensus. Con means together is what that previous means. So back then, people still want to understand the world. And they have a technique for understanding the world that is called natural philosophy. And natural philosophy works like this. You have a person, and this needs to be a person who has a lot of free time, who has the ability to spend time on this. Um, and that's just from the beginning, already we're going to be filtering out some people. Because in ancient Greece, if you are a laborer, you're going to be spending all day long working. You're probably not going to have time to do any of this. If you are a craftsperson, you're going to spend all, the, all your time working. You're not going to have the time to work on this. Uh, if you're wealthy, and you're busy managing a household. Has anyone ever heard the term economics? Yeah. yeah it, most of you probably heard the term economics. It comes from the Greek word oikonomikos, which means management of the household. Uh, the household here being not like a singular nuclear family, but you'd have like one family and all of the people that worked for them. In layers and layers, you can have hundreds upon hundreds of people that work for a specific family and they would be managed by effectively the lady of the house. So if you had a rich family, then the wife of the person who owns everything is actually the person who runs them. So if you're a wealthy woman, you don't have time to engage in natural philosophy. You've got a household to run. And by household, I mean like an entire industry, right? You effectively are running a small business, a large business, right? But if you are wealthy and you've got somebody else to run things for you, then you potentially have free time to engage in whatever your society views as being a reasonable uh, and appropriate use of your time. And that's gonna depend on where you live and what's important to your culture, right? If you live in ancient Greece and you're a really rich man, you're probably participating in democracy. You're doing politics all the time. If you live in ancient Sparta and you're a rich man, you're probably gonna be engaging in militaristic pursuits because that's what that culture viewed as important. Uh, and in many of these cities, natural philosophy might be an appropriate pursuit for somebody who is wealthy and has free time. So, step zero, have the, the time to do this, right? You can't be focusing on your own survival or having to work all the time. You need to have some leisure time. Step one is you need to make some observations about the world. Now, that's really similar to the scientific method. The scientific method and natural philosophy start in the same place. You begin by making observations about how the world works. But then, you don't come up with a hypothesis, you don't run any experiments, you don't analyze any data, you leap directly to a conclusion. You say, huh, I notice all these things, okay, here's what's happening. And once you've said, here's what's happening, then you take that explanation and you apply it to new and interesting scenarios. You should be able to use your explanation to explain new things. And then lastly, you get to do the fun part. Who here has heard the term like, I mean like an internet forum, right? Things like Reddit, right? And a forum is a place you go to argue with people to like debate and discuss. Uh, the word forum comes from the Greek term for like a town center where you would go to debate with people. And the way these debates worked is there were really intense rules for like how your arguments had to be presented. 
usually they would have to be presented in verse, right? You need to put it together in a way that rhymes. And there's a very intense set of what's called rhetoric, right? Basically rules for how the argument goes. Think of it, it's kind of like debate club. If you go to a debate club, it's less about what you're arguing and more about, hey, there's all these sets of rules for like how you present your argument correctly. And if you can follow that set of rules, right, if you can present your, ar your argument the correct way, you might win the debate even if your actual argument is nonsense. How many of you have ever had the experience of like arguing with someone and like you got mad or emotional and then they were like, oh, well, you obviously are wrong because you dared show emotion or like broke some sense of, right, this is the thing that happens to all of us. It's deeply frustrating where people don't take you seriously because of the merits of the argument themselves, but based on some cultural set of rules for what qualifies as a good argument. Did I say a question over here? Um, so, step four, you go argue in the town square in verse, probably against other philosophers with their own views. In short, whose argument and philosophy is correct is determined by rap battle. Probably not the best system for determining truth, but this is the classical way. This is what it means to be a gentleman in ancient Greece, is whoever is the best I'm presenting their arguments by reference. Our next person is an absolute master at this. Uh, how many of you at some point have heard of the elements and thought the following sequence of words? Interesting, 
and cool it. I can see why it was compelling. So he says, okay, four elements. Each element has a source, a place it comes from. The source for Earth is obviously the ground, right? This big source of Earth right underneath us. The source for water must be the ocean, this giant reservoir of water. The source for air, obviously the sky. And for fire, he says the source is the sun. So each element has a source. And each element is drawn towards its source. So according to Empedocles, the reason why if I hold out a rock and I drop it, it falls, is because that rock is made of earth. It is drawn to the earth. It is pulled back towards its source. So of course it falls. This is why a flame is always going to stretch upwards towards the sun. If you go outside on a cold day, you can see your breath. It comes out of your mouth and it begins to drift oh, upwards so towards the sky. Yeah, this is a compelling argument. He it did is. a good job. Right? Yes. Like, this what is about water. So water always oh, really? finds its way to the sea. Rain falls down. It gathers into streams and rivers, which always make their way to the ocean, every time. And not only could he explain well, how like individual, like pure forms of these elements work, he said, ah, these elements are what makes everything up. Yeah, when I drop a rock, it falls. When I drop a feather, it falls, but it falls slowly. Because it's air and earth. Because it's air and earth, that is exactly correct. It is made of a mixture of these two elements. And so it's perpetually caught in the state of being pulled up by the sky and down by the earth. And yes, the earth ends up winning that, that tug, but it's slowed down by that pull upwards from the sky. And so Empedocles is able, in just a few words and minutes, to explain something that took me like weeks to teach y'all about like how air resistance and gravity works. That is frankly a much more pleasing explanation than the idea that like, yes, gravity makes all objects accelerate at the same speed, but objects have different masses, heavier objects have more inertia, and there's this force called air resistance which can slow down an object, but the more inertia you have, the harder it is to slow you down, and that's why something heavier appears to fall faster. Uh, at least if it's in atmosphere, right? Like that's a much bigger, more complicated explanation than this really elegant one, which is just like, oh, it falls slower because it has a little bit more air. Yes, Emily. Uh, can you repeat the example of um, two elements combined to create something? Yes, I'll give you a fresh example. So, so one of them is a feather, which would be a mixture of earth and air, which is why a feather falls slowly. It's torn between these two sources. The other example I can give you is, say, if you burn wood. When you burn wood, you can see the flames coming off. You can see the smoke rising. We've got fire, we have air, and what's left is ash, which returns to the earth. So you can tell that anything combustible, anything you can burn, must be made of a mixture of earth, air, and fire. Yes? So like, there, wasn't there this thing called Greek fire that could like, burn on water? Yes, Greek fire refers to not literal fire. Uh, it is a chemical weapon. Yeah. Uh, but yes, they did. The Greeks did have chemical weapons. There was uh, a lot of very interesting things. There are people who designed like literal death rays that magnified the force of the sun. There's some pretty cool work that comes out of ancient Greece that can be very fun to look into. Uh, but I'm not going to go into like ancient Greek experimental warfare techniques. No. I know you would love me to go into ancient Greek experimental warfare techniques, but we're not going to do that. It's too big of a topic. Um, all right. So this is Empedocles. Um, he's a really cool guy, uh, and by really cool, I mean very strange. He sort of, he had a huge following. Um, he kind of strikes the line between being a cult leader and being a natural philosopher. He's got loads of followers who are really into him. Uh, many of his followers believed that he wasn't human, he was a demigod, and that he never died, he just like ascended up into the heavens. Um, and his really followers pointed to the fact that he didn't, that like when he supposedly died, there was no body, right? There's no body, so he clearly didn't die, right? 
No, yes. someone just buried the body. <laughs> so there's a, a separate set of stories told by his political enemies. Which stated that, like, no, so Empedocles wanted to trick his followers into thinking he was a god. And so when it was time for him to die, he walked up to the top of Mount Etna, which is a volcano, and then he threw himself into the volcano, and that way there'd be no body, and nobody could prove he was mortal by being like, look, this is not a god, he's just a dude. See, there's his rotting corpse. Uh, and then there's, like, another layer to the story of, of like, but then the volcano, like, refused to allow the lie to stand and tossed his golden sandal up onto the side of the mountain so that everyone would know it was a lie. Like, people told stories about this guy. He was a charismatic figure. People were a little obsessed with him. Um, his work is something that inspired. There's a reason why we still are talking about earth, air, fire, and water, and why we have, have award-winning cartoons to this very day that use his work. 